All right, Fred, so what did we go over last time? Well, we were looking at uh, the relationship between molarity, mole fraction, mass percent, that sort of business. That's right, that's right. Now, um, mole fraction, there's a reason why we're interested in mole fraction. You know, we rarely express concentration in terms of mole fraction. However, there is a relationship between the resulting vapor pressure of a solution and the mole fraction of the different solutes or different, um, uh, not necessarily just, just solutes, solvent as well, different components in a solution and the solution's vapor pressure. Now, do you remember what vapor pressure is? Um, oh, no, I guess I don't really. So remember we said a while back, last chapter, that if I have a container, and in this container I have some solution, and maybe this container is just for now a solvent. Let's just make it something like ethanol, all right? And then I put a surrounding, like a, a sealed dome around the container. Well, the ethanol is going to begin to evaporate and fill this space with gaseous molecules of whatever that solvent is. The same thing would happen if I had a, a cup full of, uh, of water here, all right? So if I had some water in this one, I would also get water molecules filling that space. And what do you think? Would I get more water molecules than ethanol molecules or more ethanol than water? Um, I don't know, how could you tell? Well, we can think about what ethanol looks like. And remember, I drew it like that. Are you comfortable with that? Uh, not really, can you draw it out? Sure, that carbon there is here, this carbon there is there. There's an OH group here, and then I can count to make sure all the hydrogens are accounted for by looking at the four bonds necessary. So we have that compound, ethanol, and we have water here. And we can think about which one has stronger intermolecular forces with their, their neighbors. Um, would water? Yes, water would. If I were to draw a neighboring molecule like this, I can imagine hydrogen bonding. If I draw a neighboring molecule of uh, ethanol, I can also imagine hydrogen bonding, right? But there's also an amount of hydrophobic material that's going to kind of just be in the way and not hydrogen bond. Um, so you have, a, sorry, a lower boiling point, a lower boiling point because there's slightly weaker intermolecular forces. Here we have a higher boiling point. And it's the boiling point that governs how much of this material is gonna be in the gas phase. The ethanol, therefore, is gonna have more. And the more gas molecules that are colliding with this container here uh, results in that vapor pressure. Water has higher boiling point, higher intermolecular forces compared to alcohol. Therefore, a lower vapor pressure on a container like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, I get that. So, if I do the same thing, but now I make a, a solution. A solution. I mean, you tell me this. If I have a solution here of 10% ethanol, and I have another solution here of 90% um, ethanol, which one do you think will have a higher vapor pressure? Um, I guess the 90% ethanol, right? That's right, because more of the molecules are gonna be more ethanol, therefore more molecules are gonna be in the vapor phase, fewer in the vapor phase here, lower vapor pressure, higher vapor pressure. And the higher the concentration of the, the alcohol, the ethanol here, which has a lower boiling point, the higher the vapor pressure. So you see that the resulting vapor pressure, the equation for the resulting vapor pressure is the mole fraction of, in this case, the one component, which we could say is alcohol, times the vapor pressure of that alcohol, 
plus the mole fraction of the other component, which in this case, 10% alcohol, 90% alcohol, 90% water, 10% water over here, right? So the mole fraction of the water times the um, vapor pressure of the water, all right? So the resulting vapor pressure is the sum of the mole fractions times their vapor pressure of, and this is just an example of something that has two, sol uh, two components, but you could have multiple components. All right, so what is the vapor pressure of this mixture here? If 2-methylheptane, that's this one over here, has a vapor pressure of 233.95 torr at 55 degrees Celsius, and 3-ethylpentane over here has a vapor pressure of 207.868 at the same temperature, what would be the resulting pressure of the mixture if there was 78 grams of this and 15 grams of that. Well, that's kind of complicated. Well, all we have to know is the mole fraction, the mole fraction. So I need to look, find the mole fraction of this and the mole fraction of this. To do that, I need to know how many moles of this. Do you know how many moles of this material there are? Uh, not really. Well, we know how many grams, right? Oh yeah, I can divide, the molar mass is right there. So 78 divided by 114. 78 grams, 114 grams for every one mole, right? That'll tell me how many moles there are of that material, right? And um, .684 moles of my 2-methyl material, all right? And then the other one? 15 divided by 100.2. Very good. All right. Go ahead and push pause anytime if you think you figured it out and you want to work to the end by yourself. That's very strong, very good idea. Um, but I got 0 0.1497 moles of my 3-ethyl. All right. And now I need the mole fraction of each of these. So I'm going to take the sum of this and this, and that's my moles total. If I divide those moles of the individual, divided by 0.834, all right? So 0.684 divided by 0.834, that is 0 0.0, no, 0 0.82, that's an eight there and 0.1497 divided by 0.834. That should just be the other fraction of the one, so 0 0.1795, right? These are the mole fractions. Now what do I do with those? Oh, uh, you multiply them by their vapor pressures, right? That's right. So this mole fraction times its vapor pressure, which is 230, 234, basically, I'll round off. This one here, by its mole vapor pressure, 208, that should equal the vapor pressure total. All right, so 0.17795 I have right up here, so I'm gonna multiply that by 208. That's, uh, give myself a little extra space here. That's 37.3. And then 0.82 times 234, 191.9, all right? So add that to my 37.3 here, and the result should be a total vapor pressure of 230 uh, millimeter, uh, torr, or millimeters of mercury. Okay, very good. You see how we did that, Fred? Yeah, I got it. So you found the moles of each, added them together to get the moles total, gave you the mole fraction of each of them, multiplied the mole fraction by their individual vapor pressures, and then added it together, right? That's right, very good. Here's another problem here, very similar, except for in this problem, one of the compounds is not volatile, volatile, and that means it, it doesn't uh, if you put it underneath a, a container, like we were talking about putting 10% alcohol underneath my container here, right? 
So if I did this and I put a piece of butter, for example, none of the butter is going to go into a, 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 a gaseous phase at all. And so there's going to be zero vapor pressure. We say that that compound is not volatile. Volatile in chemistry means that it evaporates easily, readily. Okay, so a non-volatile volatile compound will not evaporate. And so we have to find the mole fraction of each of these still, but the vapor pressure for this one is going to be zero. All right. So you could just still find the mole fractions of each of them. That one is going to be zero, so whatever his mole fraction is times zero. So the resulting vapor pressure is really just due to that, the, the mole fraction of the other one. That's right. Not the moles, but the mole fraction. So you still have to find out how many moles are here and find the moles total to divide the mole, uh, this by the moles fraction, or this, moles of this divided by moles total. Okay, so you want to try it? Yeah, I'll try it. Okay. So, push pause. When you're done, come on back. Okay, hopefully you try to do it. So, again, the vapor pressure of the solution is the vapor pressure of the solvent times the, or sorry, the mole fraction of the solvent times the vapor pressure of the solvent. I found that there was this many moles of my 2-methyl hexane here, and there, there's this many moles of my naphthalene. The sum of these gives me my moles, uh, let's see, oh, my mole fraction is this. The sum of these gives me my moles total, 0.7. 78 divided by 0 0.11 plus 0 0.778, right? That's how I get my moles total, right? Yeah, you have to add the moles of each. So the moles of my 2-methylhexane divided by the moles total should be my mole fraction. And then what? Then just multiply that by 37.98. That's right, times 37.98, and I get the resulting pressure. Now, what about the other one? Uh, well, it had a... Partial pressure of zero, right? That's right. It had a, um, um, uh, not a partial pressure, but a um, uh, vapor pressure. Yeah, vapor pressure. Vapor pressure of zero, right? So even though we knew, we, we knew the mole fraction was 0.11, you could add on here plus 0.11 times zero, but we knew that that term was going to cancel out. Okay. So... Uh, which one of these would give us the correct answer if we wanted to um, solve this problem? And hexane and heptane, miscible, both volatile, vapor pressure of one, vapor pressure of the other, and which equation should be used to, to answer this question? So take a few seconds, go through this one, and then give us an answer. Make sure you push pause and take time and read through it and try to figure it out. Okay, did you do it? Yeah, I did it. What'd you get? It's C. Okay, so why is C right? Well, because X is the mole fraction of the one, and um, one would be the total moles, so one minus the X of the mole fraction of the one would be the mole fraction of the other, if there's just those two things, right? That's right. So X being, let's say our N hexane, right? 151.28 being the vapor pressure of the n-hexane, and then 1 minus x could represent the vapor pressure, or the mole fraction of the n-heptane. Okay, very good. Okay, that's a good place to stop.